This is an area of work that I did a while ago, but I thought I'd cast it up anyway. So we're going to be looking at crime and its definition and measurement. So if we're thinking about the definition of crime, what, do, what does the word actually mean? We well, can take two approaches, and the first of those is the legal approach, where we would say a crime is doing something or failing to do something that breaks the law of the land. Alternatively, we could take a more normative approach, and we could say that a crime is doing something or failing to do something that contradicts the norms of behaviour for our society. You want to notice this structure here, the doing or failing to do. A crime isn't necessarily a positive act. It could be um, uh, not taking your responsibility seriously. So, classically, in, um, in some societies, if you walk past somebody who has been injured, you are deemed to have committed a crime. Uh, we call those Good Samaritan laws. The French have Good Samaritan laws. So those are our two approaches to defining crime. We, we either go down a legal route or we go down a normative route. Now, the legal definition has some very clear strengths going for it. Um, it makes it relatively easy to identify particular instances of criminal behaviour. A classic example for us would be, in the UK, carrying a small amount of cannabis. You know, I, I mean a tiny amount, not, not even enough to maybe make even a joint. Is the person carrying that tiny amount of cannabis committing a crime? Well, because it is illegal to carry any amount of a controlled substance, and because cannabis is a controlled substance, under the legal definition, we would say that they were committing a crime. But the legal definition also has some problems to go with it. It undoes the relationship between criminal behaviour and morally unacceptable behaviour. I think most people would agree that it's morally unacceptable to cheat on your wife or your husband. But we can't make that a crime in the legal sense, because if we did, the courts would be overrun with way too much work. It happens too often in our society that people cheat on one another in, in relationships. You can't make that something that the courts have to respond to. There's also an issue around whether or not the legal status of our behaviour changes over time. So, if it was a crime in the past to, to engage in homosexual behaviours, it isn't any longer. And is that the way we should think about crime? Should crime be something that changes over time? So here's the alternative approach, the normative definition. Well, this does restore the connection between crime and morality, and it does some useful things, like reflecting the, the natural way people tend to use the language of crime. So people naturally tend to say things like, it's criminal the way, you know, the way he neglects his children or whatever. Um, or poor behaviour at school shouldn't result in a criminal record. We shouldn't worry about the rights of criminals so much, they're the ones in the wrong. So normative definitions wouldn't see crime as a consequence of legislation, they would see it as a consequence of falling below the acceptable standard of behaviour. It also has another advantage, which is that it allows us to think about unacceptable behaviours that the, the law hasn't had the chance to consider yet, so here's cyberbullying. You know. Alright, normative definitions then, weaknesses that go with them. First of all, we know who gets to write the law under a legislative definition of crime. We know who the lawmakers are. But if we're thinking about a normative definition, who gets to say what the norms of behaviour are for our society? Norms of behaviour aren't written down anywhere. There's no code or law book that we could look them up in. So there's no absolutely clear statement of crime. And also, just as laws change over time, norms do so too. But they're harder to keep track of. So the norms of behaviour would also dictate a, a historically changing concept of crime. There's the definitions approach then, legal and normative. Well, so much for the definitions. How do we go about measuring crime? Well, basically, we can go with two sort of ways here. So we have the official statistics approach to measuring crime. Um, various government departments are responsible for the administration of the law. Um, they collect data to provide a description of how levels and nature of crimes are being committed in a country. So you, you can imagine that it's always in the interests of the officials to represent crime as falling and becoming less serious. So official statistics are collected to help them do that. Alternatively, we can go for a kind of victim survey, an unofficial approach, and, and talk to victims rather than talk to the people who arrest the criminals. So. Victim surveys measure the general public's experience of crime by asking for a hopefully representative sample of people whether they've been the victim of different types of crime over a given period. 
Again, we've got a strengths and weakness analysis here. So in terms of official statistics, they can collect very large sets of data. I mean, nobody collects data on the scale that the executive branch of government does when it comes to thinking about crime, because it's part of the administration of criminals and their prosecution and imprisonment and things like that, and their punishment, that you must have data about them. So all you've got, all you've got to do is marshal the data that you were going to have anyway. Um, it's more efficient than independent researchers. People are already engaged in that data collection as part of their other duties. And it usually uses very widely publicised and well-recognised methodologies. Now, that, that's not the case in every country, but in relatively stable and well-established democracies like the UK, like America, there are um, publicly available descriptions of how the data is put together and analysed. And that's very, very important that we can critique that, that we can see what the limitations are in that. Now, the thing to remember, of course, and methodology is the reason for choosing the method used. It explains why a specific research technique was chosen for a particular task. So why did you use a questionnaire for, for your survey? Official statistics are also subject to extensive critical review because of the size and status of the research. It's very hard for the government, say, to publish official crime stats that the various independent reviewers of that data, like the universities, will then go through with a fine tooth comb. Here's some weaknesses, though. Official stats are not collected for a specific purpose. So let's say I wanted to investigate um, uh, like a theoretical idea about crime. The, I would I could use official statistics, but it's unlikely the person collecting the official statistics has my theory in mind to be tested. So, given that they're collected for a variety of purposes, or not for my purpose at least, they'll lack focus for my purposes. They're collected by governments, of course, and so they may be, favored, they may be favoring a particular variety of policy. In fact, that's almost inevitable, really. And the, the tendency is that they collect quantitative data. That's more efficient, and it's also the kind of data that's readily available to the official. But it's not the kind of qualitative, rich, detailed stuff that, that tells us more about the how and the why and the wherefore of crime, rather than simply the what. Victim surveys, then, have their strengths. You can access otherwise dark figures for crimes that are not reported. Um, we get a variety of those. We'll talk about those in a minute or two. They're specifically focused on the aims and hypotheses being investigated by the, the theorist. They're often able to include qualitative data ignored by official statistics, the, the, the softer data, the more complex data. And they're less subject to political bias. Of course, they're not completely independent of it because everybody is subject to some kind of political belief system. And they can access reports from people who are not willing to talk to officials. This is kind of like the dark figure stuff. So criminals who are victimised by other criminals don't go around telling the police. But they might, just might, talk to a victim survey person. Weaknesses, then. Well, they usually work with a smaller sample size than official stats. Um, individual researchers can't survey on the same scale as the, the state. Some crimes will not be revealed, you, you know, despite our point about the dark figure. Some crimes are just too embarrassing for people to really talk about, so the, the victim might even believe them to be trivial as well. Anonymity of participants stops us being able to um, cross-check for reliability. I, I might simply report on the victim survey some horrendous crimes because of my psychological makeup. It's the kind of thing I was going to do. And respondents might not accurately remember the time scale of their experiences, so they inflate the experience of crime within a given time scale. That's the normal thing that happens to those circumstances. And that is the definition and measurement of crime.